it's a whole lot easier to make a living on the farm when we're not writing checks for external inputs all the time. So if we can produce nitrogen with a cover crop here, it's one less check I got to write in June. The word sustainable for us is it isn't, it's not good enough. We have a degenerated system here. That's why regenerative makes more sense. We don't want to sustain a broken system. We want to build the system, fix the system. And that's why we call ourselves regenerative farmers. You know, we see birds here we've never seen before in our life. We, there's birders that come to watch these birds from all over the Midwest because they hear they're here on this land. Um, we see all kinds of different insects now that we've never seen before, above ground and below ground. Um, it's just amazing as you fix and heal the soil, what can come back. We are breaking tradition, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Change is in inevitable. Mother Nature has been pretty dang tough on us here. Having regenerative agricultural practices has given us resilience so that we can adapt to the things that she's been hitting us over the head with. This works everywhere in the world. It's the same principles that can be applied to, to any piece of ground anywhere in the world, and it is happening everywhere. It's just part of the, the love of farming that you want to be able to pass that on to other generations. Um, as we get underway from our central webcast here, uh, we would like to begin by acknowledging we are in Treaty 1 territory and that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples. It's also and not the homeland of the Metis Nation. We would like to acknowledge that the city of Winnipeg and the surrounding areas of Manitoba are in uh, code red from this beast called COVID that's impacting all of our lives um, as we try and battle this pandemic and lessen the curve. Um, many areas of Canada and United States are in the same strange predicament. Uh, COVID is a beast we've never seen before and our thoughts go out to all those affected by it and also here in Manitoba and everywhere for that matter we applaud deeply respect the dedication of frontline workers on the health front as well as all industries governments and volunteers that are working so hard to try and get this thing under control and out of our lives thank you to all those people on this conference format, we are very fortunate to have Howling Pro as our AV experts. Um, for those of you that might have logged into Facebook early, the, you could see that we were broadcasting live on Facebook at 6.30, which means we are still on Facebook broadcasting live. So if you have anyone wondering if it's on Facebook, the answer is yes, tonight it is on Facebook. So that's good news for us. So as you know, or may not know, MFJ is a producer led organization with a 30 year history in Manitoba. We've worked on projects and outreach around, of course, forages, grasslands, um, also healthy soils, uh, producers, um, on behalf of producers in Manitoba. Um, in 2018, MFGA declared our position on regenerative agriculture. We wanted to do that because we want to be part of communicating and exchanging information around regenerative agriculture. We wanted to be in the conversation. Um, we wanted to help um, producers find out more um, because we really respect the farm gate decisions and we believe that uh, more information and more knowledge makes more information, more informed decisions. Um, it's important to note as well that MFJ cannot do our best work alone. We need you. We need the support of our partners in our network. Um, one great partner in our, in our network is definitely Manitoba Agriculture Resource Development. And it is with great pleasure that I introduce the Honorable Blaine Peterson, Manitoba's Minister of Agriculture Resource Development to bring welcome to our conference. On behalf of Premier Pallister and the Department of Agriculture and Resource Development, welcome to the MFGA's 2020 Regenerative Virtual Conference. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. The Manitoba Forage and Grassland Association has been a leader for over 25 years in promoting the environmental benefits of forages, grasslands, cover crops, and healthy soils, while continuing to support economic prosperity. There is growing interest among producers to learn more about the economical, environmental, and societal benefits of regenerative agriculture practices and develop their own approaches to on-farm adoption. 
Our government supports regenerative ag and soil health practices through watershed-based programming, including the Ag Action Manitoba, Growing Outcomes in Watersheds, or GROW program. We have also provided funding for several MFGA regenerative agriculture related initiatives through the Conservation Trust. A recent call for proposals for the trust was made by Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation with up to $8.6 million available for conservation projects across Manitoba to continue the good work being done to promote sustainable agriculture. 14 months ago, we released the Manitoba Protein Advantage, a five-year strategy that will grow our plant and animal industry and position Manitoba as North America's supplier of choice for sustainable plant and animal protein. MFGA's ongoing support of the growing beef industry and the positive impact of cattle on the environment shows commitment to the long-term sustainability of the beef industry here in Manitoba and the vision of our Manitoba Protein Advantage strategy. Thank you, Minister Peterson. MFGA is very proud to work closely with your department. In fact, we are tremendously proud of our relationship with Manitoba Agriculture Resource Development, um, which I outlined last week in quite detail. Indeed, uh, Manitoba Ag Resource Development is front and center at the highest level of the support for this conference. We are thrilled with the Minister's motivating words on Regen and Ag and Conservation Trust. Conservation is a great segue into tonight's presentation by Mark Shepard, which will focus on water management on your farm. The, unique, the uniqueness of the conservation and the grow trusts in Manitoba really shine brightly on a national stage for the harmony between agriculture and conservation the projects focus on. Of course, the water-focused work of conservation groups such as ALICE, Ducks Unlimited Canada, Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation, Nature Conservancy Canada, and other collaboration fits with producers' interest on water on their farms. From the federal government, the living labs, including the four eastern prairie sites here in Manitoba, are geared at water and agricultural sustainability, as are a plethora of other agriculture projects. Industry-wide, Canadian Cattlemen Association and the Canadian Roundtable for Sustainable Beef are fully on side grass and water, and the need to keep in front and to promote the great work of the beef and livestock industry on H2O and healthy land front. The mandate of the CCC and the CRSB and the Dairy Farmers of Canada is further enhanced here in Manitoba by the Manitoba Beef Producers led by Diane Riding, uh, President, and Carson Callum, General Manager, and the Dairy Farmers of Manitoba led by David Weens, President, and Brent Achmachuk, General Manager. Indeed, respect for cow, livestock, and pastures and grasslands as a water conservation tool and agricultural profitable. It showcases the importance of livestock production on healthy lands. It's something that producers and conservation groups have known for years, and it's nice to see producers celebrated accordingly via such, such outreach and very prestigious awards, such as the Environmental Stewardship Award. Here at MFGA, we have a thoroughbred in that water game too, in the form of our MFGA Aquanti model, a cutting edge high definition hydrogeosphere model that shows water movement across nine different levels, from surface water to groundwater below the surface. It's an incredibly intricate system and we have a very um, well-developed and visual um, tool. Our first phase of the MFGA Aquanti model was completed in 2018, thanks to funding from Agri AFC's Agri-Risk Initiatives and the province of Manitoba. Our MFGA Aquanti model was designed to showcase the benefit of forages and grasslands across the Assiniboine River Basin in times of flood or drought. It's just now proving to be an ex excellent piece in that conversation, as it actually showcases the historic droughts, or pardon me, historic floods in 2011 and 2014, and it shows how the water coursed across our, our landscape. As the Assiniboine River Basin Initiative leaders, um, the, who are our project partners on phase one, will tell you, um, the uh, Assiniboine River Basin starts off in the west at Lake Diefenbaker via the Capel River that carries eastward until joining the Assiniboine River just inside the Manitoba-Saskatchewan border. Meanwhile, southeast of Regina, the Suras River headwaters begin and branches south to, north, to Minot, North Dakota, before it bends back up north, joining the Assiniboine River west of Portage La Prairie, before ending up at Winnipeg at the Forks, before joining, which is where it joins the Red River, continues north to Lake Winnipeg and, and ultimately ending up um, into the Hudson Bay. 
To date, MFGA has engaged this model to create high definition water movement scenarios in the Assiniboine River Basin for stakeholders funded by the provincial government's Manitoba Agriculture Research and Innovation Committee via the Canadian Agriculture Program Partnership um, funding stream and uh, also via the Grow Trust. Um, and some of the projects that have been underway with our Aquanti model are in Verdon Scallion Creek, um, the Assiniboine West Watershed District's Oak River, uh, and the Suris River Watershed Districts um, want to understand better movement around Whitewater Lake and also the Tana Melita. As we tip our cap to the funders that make uh, this incredible planning tool a reality, we also bring forward this fact. Rarely will you ever see a project funded 100%. Um, when it happens, it's an absolute lottery win for the organization that gets it. But organizations such as ours are required to put up funds um, or work to satisfy in-kind hours or coordinate funds from uh, generous partners to bring the required match um, to the proposed projects. That match usually lands between 25 to 50 to 60% of funding, project funding. So it's a significant input um, by, the, uh, by the groups that are applying for projects and, and coordinating them and also working with others. Um, it takes a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, boots on the ground, if you will, to make a project a success. One of the key parts of this match is often by, provided by producers who volunteer field time or volunteer that they will put their land into certain practices or they will go into meeting rooms and serve on advisory committees, um, or they will take their board duties and uh, go um, give a presentation. Um, and I think that's a key component that might be unintentionally overlooked. Um, on many of these projects, it's not just the land the producers are providing. In many cases, it is additionally producer expertise. Um, it's also another very good reason to support MFGA as we participate in projects. Please do understand MFGA relies on the two, two necessary prong, prongs through conference and membership. And our third prong is projects. So it's, it's very important to us. So as such, anything that we can um, match monetarily uh, or help build towards match monetarily um, does help us as well in, in, in our candidacy for these excellent projects. So if you're watching this thing and you like what you're seeing, um, please feel free to visit our website and look for um, opportunity to donate or become a member. Okay. So conservation water, that is the name of the game tonight. Um, agriculture producers at the forefront of both. So the agenda has been set. There's interactive abilities. As uh, some of you know, we've answered your questions from prior speakers. We have also posted both of our previous webcasts on the MFG website. And uh, I suspect that they will be um, done quite quickly again this week. As you know, thanks to the great support of our sponsors, we've waived the tennis fees for our four webcasts. And I've told you a bit more about MFGA and our, our projects, uh, et cetera, but I've really not told you too much yet why we are here. And every time I watch this next video, I uh, get very proud of, of our people. So with that, I'll let you tell, I'll let our MFJ producers tell you what regenerative agriculture means to them. Regenerative agriculture to me is leaving the land better than you got it, improving soil health, improving our lifestyle. A regenerative farmer is a farmer that looks at the system that we're managing as a whole, try to be profitable, but at the same time enhancing our natural ecosystem, constantly improving the soil and the landscape that we produce food on. Regenerative agriculture is a management mindset, farming and ranching more in tune with nature and nature's processes, being less reliant on external inputs, improving the soil health. If you have healthy soil, you have healthy plants, you have healthy animals, which in turn changes into healthy humans. Healthy soil is important to the success of a ranch because you can grow better crops, your animals are healthier, way better water infiltration. If we've got excessive moisture, the water goes down into the land and is stored in the land, doesn't run off, and then in the dry times, the water's still available for the plants because it's stored in the soils. 
The future is looking good for our ranch. The soil is getting better instead of worse. Our organic matters are really going up in the soil. We're making nutrient-dense food for our livestock and the people that eat it. It's just kind of a win-win situation. When I started farming, I graduated from the University of Manitoba with a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture. Came home to the farm doing things pretty standard, lots of fertilizer, big yields. We were struggling with the profit. That led me to look for a more low risk, more resilient type system. We could start to see the potential to integrate livestock with the grain farm. As we were spending less money on synthetic inputs, there becomes more margin that we can keep in our pocket. The train really has left the station for regenerative agriculture. There's no looking back. And now, best of all, consumers are figuring out that there is this thing called regenerative agriculture, that they can seek out products that are produced regeneratively, and they can put their consumer dollars to work building more resilient farming systems. Regenerative agriculture has made our ranch more viable, mostly by extending our grazing season. We have a lot less days on feed than what you would consider average. When you can increase the production of the soil naturally, you don't really need to necessarily go out and buy more high-priced land. If you can double your efficiency on that land. Grasslands, you're not doing them any favors by leaving them dormant. You get animals in there and they get everything moving and cycling through the soil again. Regenerative agriculture makes you assess what you have available on your land. Whether you have rough coarse land or good crop land, you have to look at what's available. You have to have a long-term picture of what you want on it. Once you have that picture in your mind, you have a goal to go to. If you don't have that goal, you don't have anything to work towards. I am very proud of MFGA for what we've accomplished in the last five years. We have a strong membership, we now have a voice, and we are talking to producers on a grassroots level. We don't care if you have cattle or you're a grain farmer or just forage. We will talk to everybody trying to improve your bottom line. If another farmer rancher is thinking of regenerative agriculture, I would say definitely go for it. You can cut down on your inputs, grow as good a crops as you were before, if not more. You can cut down on fungicides, pesticides, commercial fertilizer, and basically improve your bottom line. And that's all that matters is your bottom line. That's a good one. That is a good video, very biased, but very proud. So um, I like it. Thank you to Steve Langston, uh, on and old Manitoba, Dirty Tea, Dirty Tea Shirt Productions. Um, Steve just does some really remarkable work um, uh, with his drones and with his video. It's, it's just very good. So next up, many of the groups I'm about to speak about are project partners of MFGA, also part of our annual corporate support and conference support. Obviously, we can't do this without them. Um, we, we would struggle to not have them be part of our organization. And that includes our, our MFGA board. Um, you can see their names are listed there. We have an executive of Larry, Ryan and Lawrence producers, uh, Shauna, Andrea, Christelle, Aaron and Matt. Matt is gonna be your moderator later tonight and I can't wait. Um, commodity groups are Mike Dugan, Sherry Bogansky, Jacques Saquette of their respective organizations and ex-officios um, from Ag Canada, Ducks Unlimited, University of Manitoba and Manitoba Agriculture Resource Development. Platinum sponsors are Dairy Farmers of Manitoba, who I, I've talked about, General Mills, who opened up our, uh, our show with their video, Manitoba Credit Unions. They are, uh, they are key members of ours in their communities. Um, gold sponsors are uh, Manitoba Beef Producers, Central Testing, Ducks Unlimited, Manitoba Association of Watersheds, and Bronze. Manitoba Habitat Heritage and our good partners at Saskatchewan Forage Council and Talos from Saskatchewan that are, that are taking part in this. Thank you very much. Trade show sponsors, Farm Credit Canada, G GBT Angus, where Trevor and Cheryl are doing the push-up challenge. Range Ward, um, North Star Seed, Cane Veterinarian um, Supplies, Birds Canada, Boyd's Beef. Assiniboine Community College, Imperial Seed, Edie Creek Angus, Carlisle Liquid Starters, Clean Farms, Nervous Brothers Angus, and Alice Canada. And my uh, comment about Cheryl and uh, Trevor doing the um, push-up challenges that uh, on, on uh, Instagram, um, they're doing a, a fitness thing uh, to raise awareness for a charity. So uh, if you check out GBT Angus on Instagram, you can uh, follow, those, uh, follow those moments, uh, uh, certainly a, remark a very good cause. 
Okay, so we have tonight to go with uh, with uh, Mark Shepard, um, who's here, and uh, and um, we're lucky to have uh, Mark here tonight. And we couldn't have done it without uh, the support of the dairy farmers of Manitoba. Um, dairy farmers, of course, is led by David Weens as the chair, and our MFG. Um, connection is capably performed by the DFM rep on our board, who's Lawrence Knockhart. Um, after the Dairy Farmers of Manitoba videos, we'll begin our official presentations with MFGA board member Matt Van Steelen, a rancher in regenerative agriculture, um, uh, um, really um, passionate about uh, what he's doing down in the Deloraine area. Um, like previous moderators, Matt is super keen on regen ag and also grounded in science and, and the science necessary to support the ag practices on his land. I know Matt's been looking uh, forward to this for a long time and we have as well to have Matt and also Mark um, on our show. Ladies and gentlemen, Dairy Farmers of Canada. Far from it. As the world changed, we made a pledge to lead, not follow the health of our herd, the quality of our milk, and the sustainability of our practices, a core part of what we do. That's Dairy Farming Forward. That's what this symbol stands for, Dairy Farmers of Canada. What are dairy farmers doing to help the planet? Canadian dairy farmers are global leaders in sustainable farming with a carbon footprint amongst the lowest in the world. We've always worked hard and we'll continue to preserve the planet for the next generation. Caring for our planet, that's Dairy Farming Forward. Look for the Blue Cow logo. Hello everybody, welcome. Glad to have you all with us. I'm super excited to have Mark Shepard here. He's renowned for his knowledge on agroforestry and permaculture. I discovered him on YouTube a few years back with some advice from a friend on they knew I was a little nerdy about trees and just trying to learn some more about trees. So I started listening and then I bought his book and I had read that and was excited to hear a take on agriculture that's self-renewing, regenerative and profitable. It's exciting to think that we have agriculture that can last longer than one human lifetime if we can build the system. I hope you're all ready to have your minds expanded on what the potential photosynthetic capacity we have, the ability to create if we use our tools to build systems to harness mother nature's abilities. With that, let's roll on Mark's presentation. Manitoba Forage and Grasslands folks, uh, Mark Shepard here from uh, Wisconsin. I'm uh, gonna talk today a little bit about managing water on your farm. Um, or ranch, I don't know what you call it, wherever you guys are at, uh, call it what you will. The vegetation on planet Earth uh, is, is basically, um, it, it's kept alive for one by the water. If it wasn't for the water, we wouldn't have plant growth. But the vegetation types, no matter where we are on planet Earth, are driven by water. The uh, abundance of water, lower left here, we got tropical rainforests, or the scarcity of water on the lower right, uh, high temperatures, low temperatures, water is essential for growing our plant growth and it determines the vegetation types of where we live. Water also happens to be one of the most destructive forces on the face of the planet. Uh, in addition to mechanical impact, velocity of a stream, uh, there's just the, the chemical um, properties of water. Everything dissolves in water eventually faster or slower, etc. And it's the constant effects of hot and cold that break the hard crust of the planet apart into smaller and smaller pieces of water chemically dissolving it, freezing and thawing, expanding and contracting that, that break the earth's crust into smaller and smaller pieces that then the water and all of the minerals in solution interact with life to create soil. Well, in addition to creating soil, which is also where our fertility comes from, et cetera, uh, water also removes the soil. The chemical leaching of, of cation nutrients from our soils and the mechanical uh, power abrasive force 
<clears throat> our annual agriculture that requires tillage, um, whether it's organic or no-till, uh, we disturb the soil. We eliminate an existing uh, perennial ecosystem, whether it's grassland, forest, savanna, or something in between. We expose the soil to the mechanical pounding of the water, to the chemical dissolving of the water, and even with the best practices, and in this case, we have windbreaks behind the farmstead, we have grassy contour strips, we have uh, uh, hick and bottom drains, water and sediment control basins with underground outlets, yugos. Uh, that's not good enough to prevent the erosion that's happening. Uh, erosion in the, the humid climates where we have uh, frequent thunderstorms in certain times of the year that coincide with when we have exposed soil, the erosion can be severe. And here's a case uh, of a farm that I worked on. Um, obviously all their topsoil has already long since washed away. Uh, then rivulets form, it picks up more sediment, it scours a bigger channel and it makes a bigger and bigger channel. And it, as you can see here on the left side of the, uh, of the screen, that was former cropland in crops. It's been abandoned because of the erosion. And now you can see the erosion gets extremely severe. Once the, uh, the runoff gets off into the, into the wooded area, where the trees don't have the fibrous root systems that grasses do, um, erosion can be uh, insane. It is this erosive process, whether it's uh, soil blowing away in the wind or soil washing away in the water, that has defined civilizations, destroyed civilizations. Uh, ever since annual agriculture has been practiced by humans on an organized level, we have destroyed our resource base and washed all our soil away um, I was going to say, and making it less and less fertile. Well, that's true. Well, some of the problems that also occur with, with runoff, especially occur here in Wisconsin, and I'm sure you guys have it up in, in uh, Manitoba, just north of us, because we have a similar climate, is at the end of the wintertime, our ground is still frozen. And this uh, slide was taken. Uh, it, we have what they call the road ban where they limit the weight of trucks driving up and down the road. So all of the dairies uh, that have a uh, sewage lagoon for their um, manure, they'll get the call from, the, from their town to say, hey, you know, we're gonna put the road ban on in two or three days, whatever, you better get out and spread your manure because you'll have heavy trucks running up and down the road. Road ban could be on for a month because the ground is really soft and the roads will ripple. So here is a case where there's a field that was spread with manure uh, late winter, then the rains came, but the ground is still frozen. The, the water doesn't soak in, so it runs off downstream, and so we have massively polluted streams, and we wash a whole bunch of manure off the fields. You don't get the same kind of erosion uh, of, you know, scouring erosion that you would in other seasons, but now you have this toxic pollution of waterways, etc. The net result is a loss of fertility from the fields, all your fertilizers that you put on, you can lose a lot of seed, lose a lot of soil, uh, the result is not good. This, like I said before, has, uh, has ended up poorly for the societies that have uh, relied on annual crops as their primary source of calories and proteins and oils. Well, that happens to be us right now. The, the world right now depends on, on five major crops for the majority of their calories, and you're probably growing some of them up there in, in the... Um, up in Manitoba. This is actually was the uh, Eastern capital of the Roman Empire. Why would you have a, a capital city located in a desert wasteland? The whole point was it wasn't a desert wasteland. This was one of the most prime fertile valleys with rivers going through it for transportation, for irrigation. Uh, they had timbered hills, hillsides and mountainsides for roofing material and for firewood and of course for chariots and spears and ships to go and attack the other people and destroy them. <clears throat> well, I first learned a lot about water management in order to prevent erosion, prevent uh, non-point source pollution, runoff, et cetera. In this book here, it's uh, the Permaculture Designer's Manual. That's actually my uh, first edition, hardcover um, edition of the Permaculture Designer's Manual. The cover is different now, a little bit of updates, not much. This came out in the late 80s. Uh, I had been trained in ecology, uh, was not finding work in the field, and so I took off to the woods and started uh, doing my own uh, homesteading farming, 
And it was in this book that I, all of a sudden that this revolutionary idea kind of caught my mind. If you just take your field and pretend this is your field right here, up at the top of this screen is uphill, downhill. Now it doesn't matter if your landscape is really steep with steep hills or if it's really flat, water still strikes it, migrates to the low spot and continues to migrate to low spots until it finds an, an ultimate basin from which it either evaporates, soaks in, or it makes its way to the ocean. All you have to do is simply change the direction of your cultivation pattern or your haying pattern or your fence line pattern to something like this. You start high in the landscape and you go ever so slightly downhill to the ridge. You'll now cause the water to migrate out from the waterways. Uh, so if you currently have problems with ponding in certain parts of the fields, like the lower margins of the fields and low spots, the reason why that's a wet spot isn't necessarily because it doesn't soak in. It's a wet spot because it's received water from the rest of the watershed. So if you spread it back out and put it back out on the parts of the watershed where it ran off from in the first place, you'll have less of a wet spot in the, in the low spot. In the Permaculture Designer's Manual, it showed a whole bunch of different layouts of water management systems, including this one, which once again, whether your land is steep and deep with deep you know, hills and ravines, or if it's rather flat, the principle is the same, techniques are the same, it's just not as visually extreme. One of the things that we wanna do is we wanna take the water that lands on this property, and if 10 centimeters of rain fall on this, on this you know, quarter section up top, 10 centimeters of rain doesn't actually, is not the effect of rainfall on that whole entire quarter section because up on the uplands, uh, much of that would run off. It runs off and it collects in the valleys. So the valleys effectively get way more precipitation than that 10 centimeters and the ridges get effectively less than the 10 centimeters. Our idea is then to change the pattern on how we interact with our, our, uh, our property in order to make sure that the water is more evenly distributed and to hold it as high up in the landscape as we possibly can to allow us to use gravity to transport it further down for irrigation, for uh, watering livestock, et cetera. And this is just one example. I'll look, I'll see if, if you see my cursor on this, up at the highest part of the landscape, if we can zigzag that water back and forth uh, evenly um, as possible and use pond storages, dugouts, tanks to, uh, to hold the large quantities when we get a, a large rain event. That way we can store this water, use it again later when it's not raining, uh, all by gravity flow. The Permaculture Designer's Manual referred to this book here, Water for Every Farm by P.A. Yeomans. It, at the time when I heard about it, it was a out of print book um, in Australia, so it meant it had a small market in the first place, and they were really hard to find. <clears throat> Finally got a copy, and I don't know about you, um, we Americans speak a little bit different dialect than you Canadians. Uh, but I tell you what, these Australians were, it was a class by themselves. It was one of the most incomprehensible books that I've ever read in my life. If you could take the most boring textbook you ever read in school and make it 10 times as boring and incomprehensible, that's what this was to me. I've read it dozens of times through the years trying to understand it. It never gets any easier to get past just how it's written. But there were some concepts in it that really caught my attention that I really thought was, uh, were really uh, cool ideas. One was this thing that they called the key line cultivation pattern. If you look at this, the, all these dotted lines, they're superimposed on top of a sketch of a contour map. So these lines right here are the elevation 200, 205, 210, 215, et cetera. Well, where the head wall of a water drainage all of a sudden starts to turn flat and now becomes a valley form. So if you watch the cursor here on the right, that is a seasonal water channel. No water runs down until all of a sudden it does rain and, and not all the rain soaks in. The, this water channel is where the rain first starts to flow. So the key point is right up at top, just before that, that water hits the flat spot, accumulates enough and begins to flow. If you go to the key line in every primary valley, these little uh, initial water channels, you make a contour line from that key point 
and then your cultivation pattern is parallel down from the key line, partner that with going to the lowest ridge contour and go parallel up. Yeomans said that if you do that pattern, all of the water will now tend to flow out from the valleys and uh, toward the ridges. So there's your key line roughly sketched in on the computer. Excuse me, I'm rather be a farmer, not a computer tech guy. If you go parallel down, then you go to your ridge, parallel up. Well, I thought that was brilliant and I brought it to my place here in Wisconsin. And I realized that that pattern, according to how Yeomans described it, didn't work. It wasn't true that it didn't always happen that if you, if you followed this key line cultivation pattern, it would spread the water from the valleys to the ridges. And in the 25 plus years since then, installing hundreds of, of water management systems all across North America, including Canada, there's only been two properties uh, that I've ever um, uh, done a water management system on where this key line cultivation pattern actually worked. One was actually in, in Ontario. One of the things that, the second thing that really caught my attention, so the first one, I thought if that works, that's going to be great. And the second one is, oh my gosh, we want to have a swift development of deep biologically fertile living topsoil. Yes, we do. And by using these techniques, we can quickly develop uh, soil to levels of fertility um, better than ever existed in the natural undisturbed state. I read that and my, my BS meter went crazy. That's the bison shirt meter because like no way I grew up making compost my dad was a biodynamic farmer um, so I know how you can take 20 tons of material turn it into a wheelbarrow load full of compost and you scatter it out on 100 acres and you don't even see a crumb anywhere how can we possibly gain fertility that fast using these techniques well the trick was is we aren't going to be adding soil from the top up by adding more organic matter we're going to turn the subsoil, we're gonna convert subsoil into topsoil by introducing air and water and life in the form of roots and, and uh, microbial activity and so on. <clears throat> Thought it was a great idea. Uh, decided to um, kind of dip my toes in the water. Uh, went way into debt and bought a property that looked like uh, what we see on the top uh, slide, top of the slide here was a cornfield. And I was gonna see if we could convert an annual crops, corn and beans field in upper Midwest from annual crops to perennial crops over a period of time and pay the bills along the way. <clears throat> and the picture below is the result after 15 years of applying that. I've been on the site now for 26 years um, and it's, it's a lot even thicker still. Um, Yes, you can convert an annual crops system to a perennial crop system relatively simply uh, just by following nature's playbook. Um, and the first step that we wanna do is to manage the water. If you live anywhere that agriculture has taken place uh, in, in the world, the soils have been disturbed. They're not in their natural hydrological state. We're not getting the infiltration that we used to. We don't have the soil organic matter that we used to. So what we want to do is just a, a minor adjustment up front to change how that water moves on the landscape to evenly distribute it across the whole entire property. So this was the farm, the original water pattern, uh, these uh, seasonal runoff channels, only when it rains an inch and a half does this field start to overflow. Boy, and then when it does overflow, it's a 10 foot wide stream roaring down the middle of my farm, makes this huge, you know, white water river. Uh, my kids, years ago used to kayak in it, for example. <clears throat> well, then we just take out uh, a common tool that many people have. You can use all different kinds of tool. That's my favorite, this bulldozer with a six-way blade. And now we make a series of channels and mounds. Uh, USDA calls them terraces. Um, permaculturists will call them swales and berms. I don't care what you call them. And what we end up with is when we have more rain falling than can soak in, it now accumulates, hits these channels and spreads out to the ridges. We catch it in small little micro catchments and then distribute it across the ridges. That's how we do it at my property. At other places in more arid environments, we'll steer it all towards one particular location. We'll store a lot of a larger pond. Other locations still 
we'll store the water in a large pond above an area that we intend to irrigate. And in some places, actually in Manitoba, for example, I've done a system like this where the intention wasn't necessarily to spread the water out and soak it in uh, because they were on blue clay and it was almost as flat as can be. We wanted to actually create elevated areas that weren't waterlogged all the time because the blue clay, I mean, it would rain a quarter of a quarter of a millimeter and you'd have puddles all over the place and hardly anything grew there. Uh, so if we just merely plowed up the mound, we could grow things, uh, grow trees on the tops of the mound, grass in the alleys in between. The water wasn't necessarily adding any soaking to the ground, but it created a dry spot for us to plant in. So that pattern that you see on, on my farm here in Wisconsin is because of the water management pattern. Um, what we couple with, uh, with that, the, the terraces, the swales and the berms, um, we then coupled the use of a, a subsoiler strategically. And if you look at this picture here, uh, I'm gonna introduce some language that comes from the agroforestry world. When you plant a row of trees, that's the row. Then we have an alley and then a row. So that's classic alley cropping. And I've grown all kinds of crops in the alley in between here. But on, on my system, I have the alley, the swale, the berm, the trees. So the water will catch in this channel, flows out along here into this ponded area, and then it overflows on the ridge. The subsoiler, now you go in parallel to your water management system and it cracks any kind of hard pan you might have. If you, if you are in blue clay, let's take Manitoba, for example, you wanna just get a little bit of a lift, a little bit of shatter in there, so you get some more air in that. One of the issues with heavy clay soils uh, is, is air. They just don't have enough air in them. And the subsoiler is a useful tool. Uh, I've used it every couple of three years whenever I start to notice the fields are getting a little tight and that, you know, uh, additional, on my case, additional calcium or, you know, gypsum doesn't seem to, to be helping as much anymore. I'll run the subsoiler through it. And I especially run the subsoiler through if I've had a drought summer and I want to catch melted snow in the wintertime or, or rain on snow, rain on frozen ground events in the springtime. <clears throat> so the, this whole, the whole farm in the foreground was patterned based on that. And one of the things that Yeoman said was that we're going to be able to increase uh, the conversion of the subsoil into topsoil faster than ever before. And I didn't believe that for a long period of time until I was up climbing my um, wind turbine tower. You can see a guy wire in front of me here. And I took this picture. I was uh, too scared to stay up there long, so I didn't look at the picture until I got down. But what I noticed is you notice across the street the color of the soil through the fields. It's basically red clay. If you look around the building where we're gonna add on to it, it's basically red clay. But most telling is, is right here in the, in the middle foreground is we have topsoil looking soil, row of trees, and then where the old farm track is, this has never been farmed and it's red clay. Well then over here has been farmed. It's been annual crops every third year or so as I go through a cover crop rotation, uh, including small grains in the cover crop. And I've grown um, uh, mostly winter squash and pumpkin for, for cash crops. Um, everything from corn and beans, buckwheat, but mostly, uh, mostly uh, annual um, produce. But you can see here, it's like, what, why is it that we're told sometimes that tillage agriculture is destroying soil, leave it alone and it'll build soil, and yet right here where we've left it alone and did no farming on the farm track, it's red clay, and yet over here in the farm fields where we've been actively farming this plot right here for 15 years, we actually turned the red clay into topsoil called my USDA inspector guy, his name was Sam. I said, Sam, you gotta see this stuff. We turned this red clay subsoil into a black sticky clay topsoil by using these techniques. Well, once you couple that, that's in, that's in the annual fields right here. Once you couple that with uh, planting rows of trees, and in our case, we encourage uh, growers to plant polycultures that mimic your natural plant community type. And a polyculture is many different species of plants uh, and your local plant community types, we'll get to that in a few slides. They're the ones that are more adapted to your region. They've been living with each other for zillions of years, tall trees, medium trees, shrubs, vines, cane fruit, shade tolerance, fungi, etc., all growing in a single row. And instead of uh, 
all of a sudden taking on more work and treating it like an orchard, we treat it as if it's a natural system. We just plant it and we kind of ignore it for the most part. We'll farm on either side of it, whether you're growing hay or grazing or tillage crops, small grains, um, that will be on either side of it. That kind of maintains the woody crops in the middle. The woody crops act as a windbreak. They act as deep nutrient recovery. They, they draw nutrients that have leached from you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 uh, meters down and bring them up into the leaves that fall in the autumn that then get incorporated into the soil. And they're locally adapted. They're easy to maintain. We don't use any sprays or anything on it. And then later on, we go in and we either harvest the perfect fruit ourselves and sell it, uh, and then have livestock finish off the um, less than perfect fruit, or we just reserve it all for the livestock and have them clean it all up. There's a picture of my dad right there. He's checking chestnuts. Uh, these are some of the cold hardiest chestnuts in North America. They actually are uh, some of our hybrid chestnut genetics growing in uh, Saskatchewan anyways, and in many parts of Ontario. I don't know how far north our chestnuts have, have gotten. Um, they don't do as well uh, in colder climates, not because the plant doesn't survive the cold, but because it may not have enough heating degree days uh, to ripen a kernel. Um, and that might happen, might change the further you go north and interior, you might get enough heating degree days to, uh, to ripen a crop before frost comes in the fall and, and closes those spiky burrs up tight. Underneath the polycultures, we get like the development of real forest soils, just amazing stuff. This incredible accumulation of sticks and leaves and of course, any kind of soil microbial activity. So we can turn that kind of soil, red clay, into a black sticky clay, just using our annual crops and cover crops, et cetera. Start adding that woody polyculture component to it and we start getting some real serious soil building going on. Um, I thought that my discoveries were somewhat significant. Uh, Fred Walters at Acres USA encouraged me to write a book, so I did. If I knew it was gonna win three literary awards, I would have tried to do a better job at it. Um, it's a restoration agriculture. I think this little thing down here that you take a picture with your phone is still valid. It takes you right to the page where you can order it. Well, this is the overview of our whole protocol of what we call restoration agriculture. We're gonna accomplish ecosystem restoration and agricultural production simultaneously on the same place and do it in such a way that it doesn't break the bank. Um, the follow-up to this is a series of books that are gonna describe each of the techniques of how to do a restoration agriculture system. And the first that we do, of course, is to manage your water. The opening slide, had other funky things put on like a ransom note here. This is the actual cover of the book. And lo and behold, once again, it went and got nominated for, for a uh, literary award. So there must be something resonant with what I'm talking about, what I've been doing for the past you know, 25 years that makes sense to a lot of people. Otherwise, it wouldn't, wouldn't be recognized uh, by as many different places. So go ahead and order these books. A lot of what I'm gonna talk about here in this little 15 minute slideshow, um, goes into extensive detail in this book. One of the heads up, if you order this one, if you get the audio book, you're gonna miss a lot because this, this particular book, Water for Any Farm, um, it, it, it relies heavily on illustrations and photographs to show you exactly what we're talking about with various different landforms. And instead of using a, a drawing of a topographical map to show different things, we use actual topographical maps from actual pieces of planet, et cetera. So check it out, uh, pretty cool book. What it comes right down to is when the rain falls on this property, if more is falling than is soaking in, let's capture that, let's spread it out, slow it down, soak it in, store it so we can use it later. If we just let it accumulate and run off, uh, that is wasted productivity. We could use that productivity later on. If, if you go four, five, six weeks, we went six weeks without rain in the middle of the summer here in Wisconsin. Um, things on my farm did all right because of all this water that's been banked in the soil over time. The soil organic matter has increased over time and I've had water stored in ponds that I can pull out later and irrigate by gravity. And this is, a, this is really simple, fairly flat land, 
the water used to flow right from the house straight down the middle. But now whenever it tries to flow straight down the middle and form a puddle in the shadow here, it spreads out using those, those swales and berms. Partnered with those swales and berms that you really can't see right now are trees planted right along uh, the line with the, with the berm where the, that mohawk haircut of grass is. There are planted uh, trees right in there. So our protocol, the restoration agriculture protocol is to identify a natural plant community types. No matter where you live on planet earth, there are food plants, there are medicine plants, there are fiber plants, fuel that will feed you and supply you know, all of those necessary things for the human race, no matter where you are. If you wanna grow um, avocados in Northern Manitoba, good for you. But what you're going to have to do in order to get that environment to grow avocados is going to cost a lot in time, money, sweat, losses, et cetera, et cetera. You will have the best chance of success using things that are native to your area or at least closely related to what's native to your area. So identify a natural plant community types. Then manage your water. That's what this slide presentation is supposed to be all about. That's what Water for Any Farm is all about. Then we plant perennial polycultures. Perennial polycultures, the perennial, they come back year after year after year in agroforestry systems. And the, the one system I mentioned already was alley cropping, where we have a row of trees and an alley of our crop, row of trees, alley of crop. We'll show a second technique later on, which is silvopasture, which is managing trees for their timber value and their fruit or nut crop and forage for livestock that grazes through the system. Then we install our fences, roads, and other infrastructure along the same pattern laid out by the water management system. If you, if you do a water management system by you know, digging channels or making terraces and dugouts, uh, and then you try to operate in, in, a, in a grid pattern across that when the shape of your land isn't a grid, uh, you're gonna have conflicts with your fencing pattern and your transportation pattern intersecting with the water management system. Once you put a water management system in place, you design your farming enterprise around the water management system. That's why most of the systems that we uh, install are called parallel systems, is we uh, have all of our swales and berms, our sinuous channels slightly off of contour, and then we strive to make those parallel to one another throughout the landscape so it's easy to use uh, equipment and machinery, even if it's horses or wheelbarrows, whatever your equipment of choice is. And then we manage fraternity by closely mimicking the natural disturbance regime of your plant community type. Also, everywhere around the world, the plant communities that are adapted to an area and the plant communities are adapted to where you live, whoever you are listening to this, the plant communities are adapted to where you live. They can handle whatever your place throws at them. They can handle wind, fire, you know, ice storm, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes, volcanoes. So if we mimic those disturbance types and what that disturbance does to that plant community type, we can now steer our ecosystem through time with minimal effort because it's almost natural. And then if nature comes along and throws a 175 mile an hour derecho wind at us like just happened in Iowa this summer, um, our system is designed for that. It, sure, we knock a lot of trees over, a lot of roots are up, we cut a lot of logs for firewood, saw logs, mushroom logs, um, but the system did not fail. It stays together and it continues to, to yield crops. The patterns that you'll see, these are a intersection between the farming that's being done, whether it's hay or row crops or grazing, the shape of the land, the steepness of the land, the soil permeability, how much rain falls, the type and intensity of rainfall, all of those get worked, mashed together into a pattern that now moves the water where you want it to go uh, within the legal constraints of what your legal frameworks are. For example, in this particular field, we took water that, that was formally going down these slopes to the upper left of this photograph and you know, filling this pond. Uh, and we took it around the ridge this way and distributed over all the way over on this side here. There were places in Ontario where we weren't allowed to take water from this watershed that went that way. We're not allowed to take it around the ridge. So we have laws that we have to comply with. 
uh, you can't get closer than it. And here in this case, we can't get closer than a certain amount of feet to the water body. Um, we have the property boundaries or our other physical constraints. We have uh, existing hard infrastructure like homes and, and buildings. Uh, we have roads, we have septic systems, utilities that we have to design around and design into. But our goal here is to manage the water to increase productivity uh, and to ensure against drought to um, also, it also protects us against floods. There's another pattern. This one is in Michigan. You can see all these different patterns. This is all the water movement pattern. This one eventually will have a pond located here. This is almost at the top. This is the top of the landscape. This is way up top in a saddle between a little knob here and that knob there. So instead of having one, two, three, four different units that are square, each little field is now connected all the way across the whole entire property. Um, and so equipment use becomes uh, more efficient when, when designed properly. This is a case of, of multiple infrastructures. This is like a recreational walking trail. This is a gas uh, pipeline. Over here is where the electric utility, somewhere through here was where the septic, I think it's right through here is where the septic utility went through. So we had to go uh, over certain pipes. We couldn't go within certain distances of certain wires. And still we were able to move the water uh, from this subdivision that was built, overflows, fills a pond, fills another pond, and then it gravity feeds through the system and cascades, zigzags back and forth. And then they can use this water uh, with a siphon to water things in their um, CSA produce patch, in their uh, high intensity berry patch, or in their, their hoop houses. <clears throat> Oftentimes we do our uh, workshops in conjunction, or you know, a presentation like this in conjunction with a workshop. We go to a farmer's place, we do an installation, and we have 20, 30 people that pay to come and learn along as we go. And then we go out, we put the system in the ground. We put in the terraces, the swales, the berms, we measure off all the alleys. And then that, that uh, tractor down to the left is now pulling a tree transplanter. This particular field right here was 18 acres. So what's that, five, almost five hectare. Um, there was a crowd of maybe 25, 30 people that each paid a couple hundred bucks to learn. Uh, and we did the whole entire field with uh, terraces, two ponds, you know, the terraces, outlets, and trees, we put it all in place in um, less than a weekend. There's a tree transplanter, a good, a good tree setter, this guy's sitting on the machine right back there. If he's on his game and the conditions are right, he can put in, you know, 10, 15,000 trees a day. Uh, and we don't have to put in single species, we can mix the species in. Um, and as you see, we're putting in the inexpensive sing one year, uh, 18 to 24 inch um, nursery stock of, in this case, edible woody crops. At this particular site was a lot of walnut, a lot of chestnut, and I believe they also did hazelnut. Now let's go up to your guys' neck of the woods. And I was looking at this map and they, they kind of, they're missing a lake over here, aren't they? Isn't there supposed to be another lake up there? Anyways, you guys are located right up in this region here. So what is our plant community type up there? You guys are at the northern end of Oak Savannah, northern end of the northern uh, mixed hardwoods, kind of at the eastern part of the pure tall grass prairies, and, at the, and at, at the beginning, the middle, and almost to the top end of the Aspen Parklands. You see a lot of this is the natural plant community type. Obviously here, you look in the background and see all the yellow. You guys in Canada know exactly what all the yellow is. That's your, your canola oil. Um, Aspen parklands, lots of grasses, uh, heavily dominated by uh, aspens, a lot of birch that are thrown in there. And because it's at the intersection between, you know, the southern forms of it, if you're coming up the southern part of uh, Lake Winnipeg and so on up to the middle, we have a lot more oaks and cherries and hawthorn and hazelnut thrown in there. For on the eastern side, you're going to have a lot more of the jack pine and white pine. And on the northern fringe, you'll have a lot of the white cedar and black cedar thrown in there. Of course, white cedar in, in the swamps in the eastern part. It's a great, it's a great transition zone between the various different uh, regions. Well, it just so happens that I have quite a bit of experience in that, in that terrain. 
This is at, as at my first property, just a little bit further north than you guys. You um, Manitobans might recognize this place up here. Well, my first property was right up over here uh, in that zone there on the north side of those mountains. So most of the land was flat, almost flat as can be. Then all of a sudden you got these foothills and these gigantic mountains. I was in the foothills that, uh, on the other side of those particular gigantic mountains. But the plant community types were, you know, very, very similar. As a matter of fact, it's, it's uh, if you look at certain maps, they say that the Aspen Parkland extends up into right where I was. If you wanna learn about your natural plant community types, especially the Western Boreal Forest Aspen Parkland, grab you know, a textbook like this. This will tell you a whole list of species that are applicable, natural, native, they belong in your area. So all that I did when I got started was like, okay, if these all grow here, what are the ones that grow some sort of food thing? Either I can eat it, I can sell it, or I can feed it to an animal. And if I can feed it to an animal, I'll sell the animal. I don't have to grow fancy new crops using fancy new techniques and try to market products that nobody knows about I'm gonna grow things that everybody can recognize, you know, nuts, berries, um, grains, and pigs, and chickens, and cattle. So we're creating water managed systems. What you have here is the former existing waterway you used to have erosion gullies going down it, down the center of the screen. We capture the water as high as we can in a dugout. <clears throat> when it fills out, it, it spreads out, then it sheets across the landscape. Every time it tries to concentrate again in the channel, it spreads back out again. It tries to concentrate, we spread it out. If your land is flat, don't worry about it. It's not as flat as this place. This was a uh, former international sports complex with 30 different soccer fields on it. And the soccer fields were crowned 10 centimeters in the center going to either side that went to drainage ditches into pipe that brought it off to screen right and dumped it into the river. We can still move the water on our property and even if you have heavy clay soil that needs a, a certain amount of drainage to remove the water during super wet times, you like are in a polder uh, below water level in Louisiana um, you know, places in Alabama, this place is in the Netherlands, obviously, where you want to keep the water level below the soil level so you can actually get crops to grow. You just dig your channel starting shallow and go deeper and deeper and deeper till it goes into a dugout and you can effectively lower the uh, water table in your field. This particular client uh, did it to, uh, with this particular pattern, obviously not to accommodate large combines, but to accommodate um, bow hunters. They demonstrate um, uh, archery products for a archery company and their clients come through here and they go on quote unquote deer hunts, but they hunt deer, uh, hunt sheep and goats that are domestic sheep and goats just to test out the product before they buy a bow. <clears throat> These systems are peppered with little ponds. Most of them are ephemeral ponds, they're shallow. They only, uh, they're only there for a few weeks or months. They soak in or they evaporate. They're a host to wild, wildlife, waterfowl, um, all kinds of insect eating birds, insects. We've got uh, dragonflies over here. It looks like that dragonflies after monarch butterfly. Um, oftentimes we uh, seed the berms with a, a native wildflower mix, prairie flower mix, and in this case, Obviously, you see lots of um, uh, milkweed for the butterflies. Instead of just bringing in uh, pollinators to pollinate your crop, such as an alfalfa for seed or canola or fruit, why not have wild pollinator habitat spread throughout your whole entire system so they don't just come out and eat when your crop is in bloom. Uh, the wild pollinators have some place to, to eat, to stay, to raise their young, to raise next year's pollinators so there'll be pollinators there ready for you when you need them next year and it's beautiful you can sell the wildflower seed uh, as additional income you can plant alternating strips one berm can have this wildflower on it that's harvested for that seed the other berm can have that wildflower on it and so on and so on so you have a, a series of alleys with your current crop grazing or or, or crops and then the berm has uh, wildflower specific species of wildflower intended for sale of seed. 
<clears throat> this this guy harvesting wheat obviously is not intending to make a lot of money off apples short term. So why just sit around and wait for the apples to get larger? Continue to grow your crop in between. That's the magic of alley cropping. Keep doing what you're doing. Add trees. You'll actually increase your total yield. And uh, agroforesters will call this the land equivalent ratio. When designed right with the cropper, with a proper crop selection and tree species selection, you will take a little bit of land out of production from your crop and you will get a smaller yield out of the trees. If you had planted this, all the apples, you'd have higher yield of apples, all the wheat, higher yields of wheat. Less yield of wheat, yes, less yield of apples, but combined more yield than either apples or wheat. Uh, this is an alley cropping situation in Guelph, Ontario that's since been bulldozed to make way for development. Uh, downstream, if you're not harvesting nuts or fruit from your trees, you're harvesting the timber, which is what they did there. You see the markings on the trees that says, cut me next year, and they did. I like to use pigs in my silvopasture system because I'll go through, before the pigs ever get turned loose in there, uh, this is an elderberry um, and a chestnut system. I'll go through and I'll pick the elderberries when they're ripe. Then I'll go through and I'll pick the chestnuts when they're ripe. And when the chestnuts start to taper off, put the fence around it, move the pigs in, they clean up and they fatten it up. And they, uh, I put rings in their noses so they don't plow up the pasture. You can use them to plow the pasture if you want to. <clears throat> Cattle in a pine system. I could see this all over the Aspen Parklands. We have uh, Korean pine and Siberian pine overstory. Hazelnut shrubs is an understory and grass as far as the eye can see with cattle. That's, that's zero input farming folks, really is. You never have to plant it again. And it's there for years and years and years and years. And, it, and, and I'd like to conclude on this slide just because this gives us something to look at. This is an imitation of what belongs in the Aspen Parklands. This is a pine heavy polyculture in a grassland with animals and the, uh, something that resembles fire. We can use a finish mower or we can use a, a baler to kind of remove that biomass, etc. This is a perennial regenerative system because it can regenerate itself and produce more of itself in the future. More cattle in the future, more hazelnuts in the future more pine nuts in the future from seed and seedlings. So I'd like to encourage all of you to imitate your natural plant community types, manage your water, spread that water out, slow it down, use a subsoil, get it to penetrate, uh, put it into dugouts for, for storage for use later, uh, convert to a perennial system, a rotationally grazed uh, livestock system, and you have a zero input system that can be here for 4,000 years. So in six, the year 6,020, I'll see you guys November, whenever it is, and we'll walk through your system and see how you've done. So here's for farming for the present and on into the future. Thank you everybody for paying attention. Bye-bye. Oh, that was excellent. It's extremely informative different way of looking at agriculture i just would love to eat one of those pigs i bet they're just amazing um, there's no comparison with a pasture raised pig and a conventional raised one in my mind there's so much more flavor so. Pasture raised and then chestnut finished. And you're keeping me from my dinner, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, great. Um, so we're, we're here at the question and answer now. And I'm going to start off with a question that came in to me today by email. It's from my friend Charlotte. And it's a question regarding tree establishment in a perennial forage stand uh, mature hay land or pasture, alfalfa meadow brome mature stand. They're wanting to plant a mixture of trees. It's a sandy soil beside a river, evergreens, birch, poplar, and some fruit trees. And they're looking for tips on tree establishment. Well, one of the, one of the issues uh, 
you know, right off the bat, brome is pretty competitive, really dense fibrous root system, competitive with young trees and especially on sand, your issue is gonna be water. And so perhaps, and there's a whole number of things that you could do, but one of the simplest things I'd probably give it a try is I'd go till a, you know, three or four foot wide strip, you know, either plow it or till it uh, just to, to harass the grass that's there, plant the trees, and then uh, for irrigation, <clears throat> um, I have some T tape, the letter T hyphen tape with the emitters at one foot apart. And I just keep it in the shed in case I need it. And if we don't get the rains, I have a uh, 2,500 gallon tank on an old hay rack. And I just drag it out to the head of the row and you put the, the T tape on the end of the nozzle and you, you open it up. I give it about one, uh, one, a gallon of water per foot and a hay wagon like that with 2,500 gallon tank, it'll run 2,500 feet of tea tape. And so uh, I have that on standby. I've only had to, you know, three or four years in the, in the past 25 years of I had to irrigate though I'm on clay soils, totally different uh, situation. That's what I'd give it a try at first. You know, little, if you're, if you're uh, organic and got a field cultivator, cultivate on either side during the uh, growing season. You can use, you know, plastic mulches, paper mulches. You, there's no end to the amount of money you can spend and the work that you can do to, to plant trees and keep them alive. Uh, I couldn't afford ever afford to do that. So I've always done it uh, as little as possible. And there will be losses, just, you know, there will be losses. Right. Well, you'll find out which trees are suited for the environment of those species if you allow the a few losses and try and prevent it with a bit of irrigation if there's a major shortage in the precipitation that that's the first and foremost because think about that these 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 plants are coming up in the ditch on the side of the road people go by with a lawnmower to make it look smooth and green i mean if if you can't kill it that's that's a good plant to choose yeah what 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 is nature telling you wants to grow there what is the rm uh, rural municipality here fighting with to try to to kill we need the food edible cousin about those certain trees to to provide our our perennial systems and another another way that nature rolls is if you look under you know uh oftentimes you get you guys probably have manitoba maple right when that female puts all these little seeds down you'll get like 10 million little seedlings out of those 10 million seedlings, maybe two, three, four, five uh, make it to maturity. So plant more, more densely, and then you'll, you'll be able to accept a few losses. If you plant trees, you know, 20, 30 feet apart, and you have two of them die, you've got a gigantic gap. Put them in closer. Right. Yeah. If you end up with too many, you can always transplant some, or, or if you have to, you can use them for something other firewood or something if they're really thick which yeah there's over there's over 200 part, there's over 200 participants on this this little uh, webinar right here if you sold trees to half of them thin your trees out and sell them that's 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 a good profit yeah okay we've got a question here from larry wagner and he asks do you have experience with leaky weirs we have got one by accident, water going through shale and coming downstream. Um, th there's a lot of common name terminology for a lot of different things, but like a leaky weir or a gabion, something that, that doesn't prevent the water from flowing down a seasonal channel, but it'll kind of uh, slow it down quite a bit. Uh, when in a wooded area on a hillside like bluffs going down to a to a stream or something like that, when thinning out the uh, forest canopy to get more light for the grass to grow, we'll take the branches and tops and lay them uh, across the slope just uphill from the trees that we retain on the site. So we'll have like this brushy leaky weir all the way across uh, the hillside. Then it catches leaves, grass starts to grow in it. So you got these linear uh, decaying brush piles um, that are mini compost piles. So that's similar to a leaky weir, but it doesn't go across the stream channel. Most of the work that I do is we, we don't go into stream channels 
just because of all of the legalities um, that you have to deal with. And I don't know about you, I'd just rather avoid having too much to do with people who pretend to be official. Yes, absolutely. Okay, question from Ryan. Can you capture enough water in small ponds to provide significant water to the landscape for irrigation during times of drought? I guess we are a little bit shorter of rainfall here, especially in July and August, we can get pretty warm and, and short on those summer, late summer rains here. I think that's probably what he's referring to. So that's actually a question that can, can absolutely be answered yes. However, it has to be designed accurately according to you know the resource that you actually have you know there's places um, i actually just came from a place uh, in california usa where the equivalent amount of rainfall that falls on a piece of property we had to have a catchment area which is where the water rains some of it will soak in eventually some may run off well how much runoff happens this is how much runoff happens. We needed like 20 times the amount of catchment area to store in a dugout in order to irrigate fields of a very specific size. So that's all mathematical. In the US, our uh, USDA actually has uh, all kinds of data on what they call the design storm event and all kinds of water infiltration rates, etc. So uh, we would go to our USDA office um, and specifically ask for that information. You know, how much catchment area do I need to store in a dugout of a certain size? And then that will store these many gallons or cubic meters of water for irrigating land of what size? What crops do you irrigate? You could have more uh, irrigated crops of a less thirsty plant fewer acres of a more thirsty plant. So that's something that requires uh, quite a bit of reality-based planning. And so start researching with, uh, with where you can get data on the effective rainfall, the amount of rainfall that actually penetrates, and then the design storm event. That's the magic word in USDA, is what are the, the storm sizes that will generate the runoff that require you to have some kind of storage in place to prevent um, erosion and damage. Yeah, well, it would totally depend on your landscape, your soil type, and if you're able to, to, to dam, it would be way cheaper than to dig a huge hole, or, or, uh, or if, if, you're, if you're sandy, it might run through, so it, it's so variable, but it's and, interesting. And actually, the, uh, you know, the digging a big, huge hole, sometimes that's way easier, because then you don't have to have it uh, engineered and designed, and you won't have a dam that fails on you. The only issue is if you're in really flat land, you dig a hole, you don't have much gravity to work with. So it has to do with the slope, the soil permeability, the rain that you get, how much rain that you get, the types of soils, the types of crops you're gonna irrigate. Yeah. And it, it's all solvable. It's all solvable. Yeah. Go buy my book and read about how to do it. <laughs> We've got a question here from Colin. He's uh, asking about the wild hazelnuts. He says in, he's seen them get a bit wormy. Is there any ways to deal with those worms uh, regeneratively without spraying? Well, here's, here's one of the fascinating things about um, the way humans have come to think. Uh, creatures that eat our things that we also eat is natural and normal. They've always been around. There is nothing that we've been able to do to prevent pests and diseases from getting at our crops. So good clean cultivation on the ground, maybe some poultry underneath like chickens will help to you know, get emerging larvae of the worms that get in your hazels. Uh, another thing with the uh, wormy hazels, most people experience with wormy hazels is they go to a bush, and they pick these hazelnuts, they all have worms, all of them have worms. That's because the chipmunks, the mice, and all of the birds uh, have been stealing the good ones while you were asleep. And you, you have to get out there and you got to pick them before everybody else does because they're delicious food. And we actually harvest uh, ever so slightly before they're ripe, um, before they really start getting harvested. And um, we use blue jays as the signal when all of a sudden you see gangs of blue jays with sentinels barking off an alarm. That means they are in the hazelnuts 
and they're you know kind of squawking at you know weasels or cats or whoever's coming at them so then it's like time to pick them and then we'll pick them as fast as we possibly can to get them out of the field um and then we're done for the season turn the pigs loose to clean up the mess yeah that's beautiful like listen listen to the birds and the beasts they'll tell you yeah. and then whatever excess or waste cycle it through another enterprise and, and then question. after after another one of the post harvest handling things is once we once we have the hazelnuts you dry them down a little bit uh, take take the husks off um, basically with the guts of a combine uh, then we float them in a tank you pour them all in a tank and the ones that have uh, holes in it from the the weevils from the from the worms they'll float to the top you skim those off and we feed those to the chickens and the pigs. Cool. Got a question here from Alan. I'm sure you've had this one lots of times before. You talk to 18 acre field in Ontario. Can you do your water management system on 180 acres? Can you do it on 1800 acres? You could probably, you know, add another couple of zeros to it. Is there slides limitations for this water management system? And I'm, people ask, I've, I've heard it asked, uh, is there size limitations for permaculture period? Um, which uh, I'd love to hear your answer. Well, on the, on the water management systems, um, there is no size limitation. It gets uh, more, uh, turns more like into one of these Japanese little pebble garden where you're raking lines in the pebbles if you wanna do it in a, in a planter box. The largest project that I've worked on is 10,000 acres. Uh, so there really is no size limit on that. One of the things with permaculture that um, uh, I see as an interpretation issue, for one, I trained with Bill Mollison. That's actually my diploma up there signed by Bill Mollison. Uh, when I trained, permaculture meant permanent agriculture. I don't know about you, but to me, agriculture means growing food. So it's all about food. And, you know, I'm not a small beast. I'm 260 pounds. Um, I eat, you know, a good amount of food every single day. That's a lot of stuff I got to grow and you can't do it in your backyard. So it has to have a certain scale. I have to be able to plant it efficiently, take care of it efficiently, harvest it efficiently and get it shipped off somewhere. If I live in the middle of nowhere, like probably most of you guys do. And uh, one of the permaculture designs principles is to take small, um, well thought out steps instead of making large mistakes. What has happened is the first adopters of permaculture took that to mean that permaculture has to be small. But it doesn't say that necessarily. It means to take small, careful steps. And one of the small, careful steps that I would like to see happen is for every agricultural region around the world is to make one small step and imitate the natural plant community types that were there before we cut them all down. And so one small change from the upper Midwest, turn it from corn and beans to a uh, oak savanna mimic with corn and beans in the middle. Let's take the, you know, the um, Aspen Parklands and turn it into the Aspen Parklands with, you know, with canola or grazing uh, in the system. Let's just make one small change and it covers millions of acres. Yeah, for sure. Like it, it's, and the repeatability of it is so interesting to me. It's like, if you think about, uh, if you have like a, a foothill or a, a mountain uh, and, and a big lake at the bottom, if you had this water management system going all the way down, the, the effects that we could have on that lake, if we had a whole bunch of mini systems that were repeatable, like working on each individual uh, property on the way down. So uh, I find that interesting. The, the, I don't think we can really calculate how much effect we can have. I mean, I guess we're trying to do that a bit with our quanti, which is, is cool. And, and with computers now, it's amazing what we can calculate. But um, you look at the impact of one small property. What if all the small properties did that on a whole landscape, the effects we could have would be tremendous, I think. And, and around here, the big thing is putting in flood control dams for the cost of billions of dollars. They put it down at the end of a river and then they blow out and they flood communities and neighborhoods. Well, why not have, instead of 
10 billion dollars that they flood the, the towns with why not have five billion dollars with the small systems pay the farmers to put in to maintain the small ones there was a chat comment here that i i wanted to um parallel with from lawrence thomas he was he was talking about regional and bio uh geoclimactic issues with semi-arid grasslands and foothills it's dynamic and most particularly on the groundwater influences fractures much different than rolling flat farmlands he's absolutely right and part of my whole point with this this ecosystem mimicry is every property is different every region is different and an answer for you know the uh, the maritimes in the east is radically different than you know the uh, the mountains of bc or uh like um uh the, the barretts was what takota had mentioned earlier they're like uh blowout sand dunes near edmonton it's different absolutely everywhere and the effects on the on the groundwater are different everywhere so the systems have to be custom designed based on your place and that's why we have to do our homework we're not saying no blanket prescriptions here these are very specific prescriptions the overall pattern is the same the details are different absolutely everywhere so correct lawrence okay we got we're getting to the end of the questions and a couple more here. Uh, what's the difference between your strategic sheer total utter neglect strategy? Sorry, lost my train of thought there to do with some minimum pruning of trees. Do you have to prune trees grown from seed and let them grow to their natural form? Or do most all productive trees need pruning for optimal growth? So there's a whole bunch of stuff wired in there. Uh, and the answer <laughs> that's, that's, that's is the answer fact. is whatever you want to do. If you want to go four thousand little runty, stunty apple trees per acre on trellises with a stake next to it, and all these little plastic zippy ties and perfect weed control underneath, and if you want to go through all of the expense and doing all of those things, good for you. I hope it works for you. Cash flow. On the strategic total utter neglect side of things, if I mimic my natural plant community types, these are the things that are growing in the ditch that we can't kill anyways. So they're gonna have a real good chance of success. Um, I'm going to mimic the natural uh, disturbance regimes, which means may mean having animals in there. So ground nesting birds eating, eating um, emerging pests, having pigs cleaning up fruit that had pests in it or nuts that had weevils in it. So imitate a full complete ecosystem to, to minimize the work and the inputs that I have to do on the pruning side of things. What I do, if you notice some of the pictures in those slides, um, if I'm driving by with my tractor and the branches kind of brush on me, they don't bother me, I don't cut them. If they go by and I can push them up over the roll bar on my tractor, I don't cut them. But if I'm there and the stick is like a lance trying to pin me to the tractor, that's it, that branch goes off. So as the trees get larger and larger, I end up with uh, no branches down low, branches up above the roll cage in my tractor. Um, and what's neat about that, especially on soft fruit, is that will short circuit the fungal um, diseases because the fungi spores, when they splash on the ground, they can't find any leaves to climb up your tree. So that radically minimizes the fungal inputs. So you do whatever you want with the, um, with the uh, pruning. Excellent. I think the rest of the questions, we're going to have to maybe get them answered later on. I think we got to keep rolling here. I really appreciate all of your answers, Mark. Um, that's excellent. Um, so what I need to do here now is introduce General Mills. General Mills is one of our sponsors and I'm excited to see that they're getting into regenerative ag. I know they're working with some uh farmers in north dakota and saskatchewan and manitoba to uh do some land monitoring which is excellent and i we're here gonna play their video here now it's a whole lot easier to make a living on the farm when we're not writing checks for external inputs all the time so if we can produce nitrogen with a cover crop here it's one less check i gotta write in june the word sustainable for us is it isn't it's not good enough we have a degenerated system here that's why regenerative makes more sense we don't want to sustain a broken system we want to build a system fix a system 
and that's why we call ourselves regenerative farmers. You know, we see birds here we've never seen before in our life. We, there's birders that come to watch these birds from all over the Midwest because they hear they're here on this land. Um, we see all kinds of different insects now that we've never seen before, above ground and below ground. Um, it's just amazing as you fix and heal the soil, what can come back. We are breaking tradition, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Change is in inevitable. Mother Nature has been pretty dang tough on us here. Having regenerative agricultural practices has given us resilience so that we can adapt to the things that she's been hitting us over the head with. This works everywhere in the world. It's the same principles that can be applied to, to any piece of ground anywhere in the world, and it is happening everywhere. It's just part of the, the love of farming that you want to be able to pass that on to other generations. Okay, we're gonna have our producer panel now. I'm pleased to introduce Dakota Cohen, a regenerative farmer from Alberta, producing grass-fed beef, berries, tea, milk-fed pork, <laughs> Sounds almost as good as chestnut fed pork. I like pork, as you can tell. And free range eggs, highly sought educator, consultant in permaculture design, recent author of Building Your Permaculture Property book that's coming out soon. Our other panelist is Justin Gerard, an organically certified Manitoba raised family farmer who farms with his partner, Britt. They produce nutrient dense fruits and vegetables for the local market. You can find strawberries, apples, native hazelnuts, hazelberts, plums, cranberries at the Heart Roots, Hearts and Roots Farm near Eli. They've got the crunchiest cucumbers, sheep, geese, and goats are also used on the farm to cycle nutrients. I'm glad to have you guys with us. Um. What we do is mostly annual and perennial food crops. They're certified organic, but we do that using a lot of animal integration. Last little while, we've been working on a, designing a water retention and distribution strategy. We've been cooperating with other stakeholders. Um, so this subject matter is near and dear to me, and I think it's really exciting, and I'm looking forward to digging in. Hi, folks. My name is Dakota Cohen and I farm a 250 acre mixed organic uh, permaculture farm near Farintosh, Alberta, Canada, which is about an hour and a half south of uh, Edmonton and about two and a half hours north of Calgary. Uh, we, on our farm, we produce grass-fed beef, milk-fed pork, uh, pasture-raised eggs, and we also have a lot of kind of perennial uh, fruit, uh, things like sea buckthorn, buffalo berry, Saskatoon, uh, red currant, black currant, raspberry. We pick them all, freeze them, and uh, and sell them to uh, uh, with the rest of our products all across central Alberta here. Uh, so on our farm, we uh, we live in about a zone three B. So we'll get uh, up to uh, you know plus forty and or plus forty and and down to minus forty every year. We have pretty good soils here, about six to twelve inches deep of kind of black sandy loam. And uh, our goal on our farm is to produce the most nutrient dense food possible. And we do that by mimicking the natural patterns of ecosystems. Great stuff. Okay, I wrote a few questions to get us started. Everybody roll your questions in. The first question we're gonna start with, how can regenerative farmers use livestock to supercharge available nutrients for annual cropping systems in a profitable way. We'll start with you, Dakota. So actually, I'm just busting to make a few comments about uh, uh, Mark's presentation, if that's okay. Just, just do, to- uh, Do what you gotta do. <laughs> uh, I, I, I just wanna emphasize uh, a couple of things that he said, and they, they kind of came up in the chat here, was um, that, that Mark, himself had, had said, but I, I, I took a course from Mark, uh, I don't know, six, seven years ago, just when I kind of was coming back to the farm, it was interested in permaculture and rege regenerative ag. And uh, the, I took Mark's uh, 
observations about patterns with you know plant species and and the you know the water patterns and things like that i took them and in his case studies of his own farm i took them as a prescription and i tried to apply them on my farm and just like any prescription you take their side effects and uh and the, the side effects were bad and so it took me a couple of years of realizing that I needed to, to really understand my own context and realize that what he was talking about was patterns and principles and, and to, to focus on that. And so like, you know, I've, I've wasted tens of thousands of dollars on uh, fruit and nut trees that weren't native to my area. Uh, so it's like when he says, find the things that grow in your ditches that you just can't kill and 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 then you can practice this the kind of stun technique the sheer total utter neglect on those species that's what he means he doesn't mean go and find you know the 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 one black walnut that's growing in edmonton and think that you can plant them on mass on a farm uh where the, the, the you know they don't exist naturally they're not going to do well versus versus if you take things like poplar or caragana or saskatoons that are those things that grow in the ditch they're fantastic. So uh, I, I just really want to emphasize, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll save you a couple thousand bucks and, and uh, focus on that. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. But I'm, I'm also curious to see, Justin, did you have any insights or, or things that, um, that popped up for you for Mark's presentation about water before we dive into the, the great questions that Matt put together? I, it was, you know, it was really exciting to hear Mark speak again because I read his book a long time ago and it was one of those books that was incredibly motivating and exciting and thrilling and gave you so much hope for the future and, um, and it really kind of uh, altered my perspective on what was possible on, on, our, on our farm. Um, so I don't know, from, I think what I take away is a, is, is a certain type of energy. Um, I agree with your point, you, know, you read it and you... When I read the book, I probably studied too closely what exactly his his pairings were and what 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 went into his rows and all this stuff of trying to find the pattern that I could apply to my own uh, farm. And to speak to your um, uh, speak to your experience, discovering that not every pattern translates as well. Um, we've been working on a water retention strategy for our place. Um, we actually were declined funding. Uh, we were told very gently that it was rather ambitious um, and to try again. Um, and I actually felt a bit of relief because um, earthworks are almost unforgivable. Um, and so it was kind of nice to have spent all this time working and thinking about a plan, trying for it and then not getting it and being able to walk around the farm again and think, okay, it's not here. I can, I can think about this all over again. Um, which actually was really beneficial. So yeah, that's what I was thinking about. Nice. Awesome. Matt, could I get you to repeat that question again? I, I, I just, so it keeps us on track. I just, I had to, I had to. So I could see the star, star, starlight in your eyes for Mark there. <laughs> so well, yeah, I'll definitely repeat it. Um, how can regenerative farmers use livestock to supercharge available nutrients for annual cropping systems in a profitable way. So we um, like we're not big crop farmers ourselves. Uh, we we only do you know 30, 40 acres of, of grain uh, you know to to grow for ourselves on a year. We we've got, only got two hundred fifty acres. But some of the ways that 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 livestock have been absolutely essential for us is is they're our insurance policy. Like we don't have crop insurance because we're not big enough and, and we, don't, we wouldn't qualify it for it anyways. But I can't tell you how many experiments with cover crops uh, and you know, you know, doing companion planting and you know, no, no tilling into pasture or whatever it was that failed and would have been in the red had we not had livestock on our farm to be able to come in and just graze the residues and at, at the very least break even uh, in, in terms of the input cost, but also, you know, you know, animals obviously have have all the you know the the benefits of of bringing you know NP and K back into the soil and the microbiology that they bring in and the impact and stuff like all all that stuff is fantastic. But for me, it uh, the, the 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 highest benefit that I haven't heard a lot of people talk about is is that insurance policy that animals give 
Because if, if you don't have any way of, of harvesting that crop, like, or even if you get hail damage or a wind comes through and you get lodging or you get an early snow, they, um, they're a way to take a bad situation and, and at least salvage it uh, at, at a minimum. But of course, then they've got the compost and, and everything else that, that, you know, there's guys like Gabe Brown can speak a lot more eloquently than, than I can about those, the benefits for soil health. Yeah, no, they definitely give you the insurance and, and the compost is great. And I'm, I'm sure you're using that in your, in your garden too, like the animals. And, and I'm, I'm sure, I think I read on Justin's website, he's doing that, but I'll let him answer for himself. Sure. Um, and I, it's funny, you know, Dakota says he's small at 250. I'm at managing 20 acres of fields. So I'm, I'm a much smaller. Um, so uh, managing, in, integrating livestock into our operation wasn't actually a decision that we made in order to generate immediate profits. I mean, obviously on such a small scale, the livestock actually is a byproduct of management and not actually our, an, a, a, our priority income stream. Um, but we did see it. Um, and in fact, I probably economically in the short term would be better off actually pumping in uh, uh, solutions from elsewhere, importing solutions, importing your nutrients, pumping out annual crops and exporting nutrients. In the short term, that actually might be uh, more economically uh, sound. But in the long term, I, that was I could see how that was starting to catch up with us, how um, every year was kind of a grind in the sense to pay for the imported solutions and we weren't building on anything. Uh, and that, so that's where the decision to incorporate livestock came from. And we made the calculations and thought it was a, a worthwhile investment to invest in bringing on more animal integration and putting in some animal infrastructure and taking our, our we are, even though we're only on 20 acres, our land is divided into class two and class three. And so uh, it was a perfect fit to put the class three into the perennial forage and to start working on creating a perennial agriculture out there while focusing on more intensive production um, on the class two land and bringing the livestock into the class two land uh, to utilize uh, nutrient cycling, uh, cycling and all that stuff. So, yeah, so I can't, I can't say that it's something that we did to immediately turn a profit. I think it will turn a small profit in the long run. It is already saving us um, money in terms of nutrients and inputs and tractor work and fuels and all of that stuff. And, and, it, and it's saving me time on machines, which I really appreciate, even though I spend a lot of time with the animals now. Um, however, uh, that sort of, you know, this money we're saving right now isn't equal to the amount of investment we're making. And the, it's the annual cash crops that are paying for that investment in the perennial and animal infrastructure but it will pay off in the long run. And we have a more dynamic and resilient farm for it. Right on. It definitely adds resiliency, that's for sure. We got a question here from Ted. When designing water storage for livestock, is a three year projected storage enough to make it through a drought? I'm assuming you're meaning water for them to just for drinking in the winter time, Ted, and in the summer, like storage for for just the, the drinking water for the livestock. So I'll start with maybe a tough one for you, Justin. Yeah, I'll leave that one to Dakota. <laughs> okay, let Dakota. Uh, so we, uh, we actually built, the first dugout we built was a million gallon dugout. And it was calculated to give us four, it was four years worth of water. We use about a quarter million gallons a year for, for our livestock and everything else. And, uh, and the first year we built it before we had done the rest of our kind of water harvesting system, uh, it, it, it didn't fill for, for three years. And on the, on the fourth year, uh, like or the, the, the end of the third season, we went into the winter with four feet in the bottom of a 20 foot dugout. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty nerve wracking. And uh, after that, I just, like we just kind of went hog wild with, with putting in other dugouts and stuff like that. It's just not worth it. Uh, however, that one of the one of the good um, kind of uh, uh, another good metric I've heard from Alberta Agriculture, they have a, a fantastic book on uh, on how to uh, how to build and design dugouts. Actually, yeah, it's Alberta Agriculture. You can get the PDF online. It's called Quality Farm Dugouts, 
And one of the metrics they give in there is you should only build a dugout in a position where it'll, it's guaranteed to fill eight out of 10 years. And, and so that, that's a really useful metric. And then to have, you know, at least, at least two years of, uh, um, or more of storage in the dugout. And so that's kind of your factors of safety is, uh, and to also kind of a, another point to, to, um, to build on from Mark's presentation is, um, so Mark was talking a lot about uh, water, different kinds of water storages, whether they're dugouts, dams, swales, you know, gabions, ephemeral ponds, uh, wetlands, all those different things. Those are all water storages. And one of the metrics I use is, is uh, there's no point in building a water storage unless you're sure you've got a water source. And so be really sure, you know, confident wherever you build any kind of water storage, whether it's any of the ones I just mentioned or any, any of the other ones that are out there, that you're that one you've got a water source and that it's it's appropriate scale for whatever storage you're building, uh, and so that's that kind of is it going to fill eight to ten years, and so that requires sometimes a couple years worth of observation. You know, watching during the spring melts, watching during heavy heavy rainfall events, doing some rough calculations, whether it's by the diameter of a pipe, you know, culvert that's running through a road that you can estimate like a sixteen inch culvert flows full bore at 250,000 gallons an hour, whereas is a six inch is 33,000, or uh, yeah, six inches, 33,000 gallons an hour. You can get those flow rates. You need to be able to estimate, okay, there's this much water flowing for this amount of time. It's this, you know, regularity to be confident before you put in a, you know, $10,000 dugout. Um, and also in our climate, the other kind of wild card is the snows. Like one of the reasons our dugout didn't fill for three years, even though it was in a good spot was uh, the winds kind of shifted for those those couple of years, and our snowdrifts ended up on a in a different valley that they didn't normally end up in. Uh, so that's where those swales are also really helpful, is they can kind of act like a big uh, eavesdrop system that can go across several valleys and then bring it to a central location, so that no matter where the water flows go, you're you're good. So basically, always there on the side of caution and and. Uh, you know, water is life and you can't really do much without it, so. Excellent. I guess a few trees planted uh, upwind of the water source would give you some snow catch in the long yeah. term. And, and we've definitely, we've definitely done that too for, for long term. And even, even the, another big one for us that we didn't realize was stockpiled forage. You can capture so much snow uh, just by not grazing or, or hang, uh, you know, certain fields down to the nub. Uh, if, if you strategically stockpile forage in a place that are above your catchments, the, the uh, amount of runoff is incredible. Plus it, it also helps to preserve the stockpiled forage and, and keep the ground from freezing and stuff like that too. But um, that was another great kind of experiment for us. Okay, we got a question here from Ross. He's wondering, have your ag lenders expressed interest in the production systems you're engaged in? What if there was a preferential lending rate for engagement in regenerative production systems? Boy, I like the way you think, Ross. Do you know a banker that does that? <laughs> you, you guys got a Justin, you a question there from Ross. So whether my lenders are, are, are actually giving me any preferential treatment for regenerative practices? Um, I'm actually come from a very privileged position where I a uh, fourth generation family farm. So I'm coming straight to land without debt. Um, and so I am actually, I do not have debt. So I'm not going, and I, and all the infrastructure that we've managed to put forward has been um, cash. Uh, so we've been slowly building without getting into debt because I'm terrified of it because it wreaked havoc on my family for generations. And so, uh, yeah, so I can't really answer that question. I, I can I can give her a stab that I, we're I'm I'm second generation organic and uh, many generations in the area and so I'm kind of in the same boat as as Justin in terms of like the land was paid for but um, we and I'm also very averse to debt however some of the earthworks and tree planting 
projects that we put in did require uh, a lot of, of uh, upfront capital with like a, a long kind of payback period. Like if you're planting a berry bush or something or a perennial fruit crop, it's going to be, you know, four or five years before you get anything off of that tree. Um, and then, yeah, it'll produce for the next several hundred years, but that's the tough window there. And so uh, I've, I've fortunately never had to go to, a, you know, a, a kind of a standard egg lender. And I think that's, that's a great idea for, for something like that. But one thing that I, I have found there's a tremendous interest in, interest in is this idea of community supported agriculture, which is, you know, the standard CSA. But CSAs have been, uh, they're, they're kind of narrowly thought as is only for veggie producers. You know, this idea that you, you know, you, you pay 500 bucks or, and you get, you know, 10, 15 weeks of vegetables at a time and you kind of share in the rest, which is fantastic. But uh, six years ago, we used a CSA model to actually plant a forest garden on our farm. So we raised $10,000 uh, at a time via this kind of share model where, uh, people were, were essentially pre-buying stuff from the farm that they would get back a certain percent every year, w leading up to like 110% return on whatever they invested in, in the share over the, over four years. So it, it helped me to cash flow the, the production of the trees and, and, and as certain things, like I, I planted, you know, like strawberries first and then, uh, you know, there's raspberries. And so I had something kind of staggered so it would produce all the way along. And that was fantastic because it, it it gave me that cash flow to 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 put everything in and get it over get it over with. Uh, that's one option. If you are going to do that, make sure you use gift cards uh, uh, because if you have to personally manage and do with emails, it's a nightmare. It's much easier to just say here's a, here's a gift card. I've got an online store. If you don't buy anything by this date, it's your fault, not mine. Uh, I made that mistake, but uh, other than that, it was a great program. And the other lending thing that I found is there are a lot, uh, the, the story of regeneration is so appealing. Like, you know, like Mark said, you know, his book has won all kinds of awards. It's so hopeful. There are so many people that have reached out to me and, and probably because I, I, I do more public speaking than the average farmer, but um I've never asked for it, and and yet people just offer it. Is like zero interest loans. Uh, I've I've had s several people come in. I've actually taken them. I've I've had a ten thousand dollars zero interest loan for five years. That somebody just he was a kind of a, a community member. I'd only talked to him a few times. He saw me speak. He came. To, he sent me an email afterwards and said, "If you ever need help, give me a call. Um, I want to support what you're doing." And I've had many people do that over the years. Uh, some of them have been like. You know, basically, if you match whatever interest I'm getting in my GIC, uh, we'll give you as much money as you want. And uh, so that's another opportunity. It's actually going directly to the community, leaving the banks right out of it. And you can get a, a killer interest rate that's just simple interest. And uh, it's a lot more forgiving. And then also, you, the reason I like that is the community is invested. Like they've got skin in the game. They want you to succeed. And so they tell everybody about what you're doing because they want to get their money back. <laughs> and so they're kind of your, uh, your advertising team while you're getting started. That's a tremendous story. I, I, that's so encouraging to know that there are people out there in the community that are willing to invest in these regenerative agricultural systems. They want to put their money somewhere where they know that somebody is managing the land in a way where it's going to be getting better and it's going to be better for future generations. I guess that yeah. leads me to um, one of the questions that we I, I come up with. Can you guys describe to me the difference between sustainability and regenerative agricultural systems? I'll maybe start with you, Justin. Okay, that's a, that's a really interesting question. And if I, I might just try and flip the anticipated answer on its head just a little bit. Um, I kind of see, I know typically we kind of see sustainable as that just kind of keeping the bare minimum, barely doing anything. And then regenerative is this launching pad, right? And, and I don't think that that's inherently wrong, but if we can kind of reimagine and reappropriate sustainability just for maybe a thought project here. Um, I see regenerative agriculture as a combination of uh, best practices um, in tandem with like a strategic deployment of energy intensive agriculture, uh, agricultural practices to the best possible amount of outcomes 
making the most ticks on the score sheet. So like, for instance, if I was to use um, my farm as an example uh, of that, of that strategy where you're deploying high energy in, uh, intensive agriculture to the most amount of benefits, whether they like profitability, ecological benefits, communal benefits. Um, you can see that like, for instance, when I feed my sheep hay, I am, I am doing the best I can to spread it on around the pasture. Uh, I'm not moving any manure. I'm getting them to deposit it for me. I'm reinvigorating these small pastures. I'm, or when I use chickens to do pest control on market garden, I'm feeding the chickens again on, on the land. They're dispersing the manure. Um, they're doing pest control at the same time. They're doing some tillage. So you're trying to get the most bang for your buck out of, uh, out of these products that you're buying. Um, and at the same time though, I am still outsourcing uh, the haying. I am still outsourcing the use of synthetics. I am still outsourcing the production of annual grains for the feed. Um, I'm outsourcing the large equipment. Um, and so I see it, regenerative agriculture as the necessary stepping stone towards uh, something new. It's the, it's, it's like a transitioning period. It's like when you, it's not, it's not like when you're in your transition towards organic certification. I think it's, it's more exciting. It's a reinvigoration of the land. It's re it's, it's putting the land back into action. Um, but at the same time, I think it perhaps is um, something we can look at as a transitionary period. And perhaps what comes next is, because uh, I'm always thinking about what comes next, is, uh, is, is some sort of new idea of sustainability where we, even, we can even reduce uh, the, the amount of energy consumed uh, in, in comparison to the amount of energy that we output. Um, so that energy deficit that's typical in most agriculture can be perhaps even reduced or, or eliminated uh, at some point only after we take the, the steps uh, towards regenerating. And, and that might be a reimagined state of sustainability. And I think you can see hints of it in uh, some of the things that Mark Shepard has achieved in his perennial agricultural systems where they become less intensive and, uh, and, and need less maintenance and, uh, and less of those inputs. No, that's an interesting take, Justin. It's it's like kind of re regenerative ag is like is the stepping stone to sustainability. Is kind of your thoughts. That's interesting. So the um, another somebody asked me this this question was a, on a couple of months ago on a tour, and they said so. So what it was basically this is like what happens after we've regenerated regenerated everything? Like what do we do then? Like do we does it? And and I, I kind of I thought about that and. And my, my answer would be that uh, to kind of quote Heraclitus, one of the, the Greek, uh, early Greek philosophers, he said, the, the only constant in the universe is change. And so it's like, like the, the um, uh, so that the, the I, I completely get what you were saying, Justin, and, and I agree, like, like, like there's, there's, this, there's going to be this phase where we actually need to put in more energy in order to kind of get the flywheel going to get these ecosystem processes. And then once, once we get back to that stage, we can just kind of coast because the natural momentum of the system will continue to, to build. Um, but I, I, I think because the, the change is the only constant universe, we're either gonna be tending down or we're gonna be tending up. Like it's, it's not gonna be this kind of plateau um, type thing. And, and I, th I think that's what you're, you're getting at. Uh, and, um, and but I have I have another beef with with the term sustainability that gets a, a little bit more philosophical and uh, and and this is so the like uh, I, I like the words there's like degenerative sustainable and regenerative and so like you know degenerative is basically this idea of a system that's kind of consuming more energy it's destroying its own source of energy materials sustainable is it's it's maintaining like Justin said and then regenerative it's it's getting better. However, there's um, there's there is a, a tendency for the a lot of the the discussions about sustainability come from a particular paradigm that's based upon the assumption that humans are bad, that humans are inherently bad, we're inherently destructive, and we can and the best we can hope to do is to just be less bad. And 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 that for me, it's, it's this kind of idea is like, do we want to have, do we want to have conservation? Or do we want to have regeneration? And so there's this, 
there, there's a subtle wordplay there. And at the heart of it, I, I believe is this idea that the degenerative system, the, the degenerative paradigm that you know started industrial agriculture and you know feedlots and, and CAFOs and all that stuff, that was bred from this idea that humans are separate from the natural world and that we're separate and above it, we're better than it. And then, then after seeing all that destruction, people started to say, well, maybe, maybe we're still separate from the natural world, but we're less than it. We're somehow bad. You know, we're fallen, we're you know, original sin or whatever you want to call it. And so I think this new paradigm that's emerging is this idea that no, no, humans, we're just a species. We're, we're, we're an organism, we're a member of a, of a larger community and we can be destructive or beneficial uh, just as beneficial as we are destructive. And, and that for me is, is uh, one of the reasons why I really like the word regenerative is it's, there's this kind of new myth of hope and, and that we don't just have to settle for being less bad. We can, we can really um, do more good. I like that. I, I really think it does. Our actions are so important and, and just choosing. We find out more and more about how nature works, how soil microbiology works, how our practices influence the land. And we can choose consciously to regenerate now. We have the knowledge, we have all the tools. All we have to do is form a collective choice to do it. It's, it's there. So I, I think it's, it's growing and it's, nothing's gonna stop it now, the ball's rolling. Yeah. Okay, there was another good question here on, from May. We have sustainable beef cert certification now. Is it time to work towards a regenerative, restorative beef certification? Or, or, or I guess that that could apply to any commodity, really. Um, it, do, you, do you guys see a future for labeling of regenerative in our food systems. Uh, Justin. So, um, I personally am certified organic. I think Dakota said he was certified as well. So I, I oh no, you're not certified. Okay, sorry. Uh, I am certified. So I, I do understand how much work goes into certification and um, all of that. And it's a lot. Um, it can be cumbersome, but uh, I personally am, uh, a, I know this is a difficult subject because regenerative means so many different things to so many different people and so many different, and so many people practice it in certain different ways. But I personally get really excited about the idea of EOVs, uh, ecological outcome verifications, uh, and that playing a role in making it more transparent to the consumer what is being achieved um, on the farm. I think that uh, if that was what the, the, the person asking the question is thinking about when it comes to ideas of certification around regeneration, I think if there was a body that would make EOVs more transparent to the consumer that a farm could show, help a farm showcase um, with clear evidence uh, and, and, and scientific proof of their achievements, um, I think that would be beneficial. Uh, I, I personally would, would be on board and I would love to have that on my farm. I know it'd be extra work and uh, I would somewhat begrudge that, but um, I, yeah, I, I think it's important. I think it's important as our agricultural discourses become um, more and more uh, contested. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of interest in the discourse from a lot of, um, different uh, areas of the marketplace. And I think there's a struggle over the discourse and the words are being bandied about. And um, I think as, as often as we can to use evidence to inform the consumer of what we're doing and to make things transparent as much as possible. Uh, I think that only strengthens our ability to mobilize certain, certain words in our favor. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of caught between two, um two places because the, so we, we, we used to be certified organic. Uh, my parents made the transition in 1988 and uh, we were certified for I don't know, like 15 or 20 years. And, uh, but mainly because of the, the, 
the workload and just the lack of ability to market it and the, the, the it, it, it didn't add anything at the time. I think now you could make the case for it. Um, we, we let it drop because people who are buying our products didn't care anyways. And so we, we've, we are above and beyond any of the certification standards. And I, so I, the, um, it, it, but it's frustrating because like, Justin, I'm sure you know producers who use the word organic or regenerative or sustainable and you know how they farm. It's like, you are the farthest thing from it. Like how, how dare you water down this term that so many people have just have, have slaved over for years to build this brand. And now it's, I think that it is, you know, a brand that is, is at risk of, of being co-opted and greenwashed. And, um, and because of corporate interest and things like that. And so my, my concern is that, and I'm not saying this is, this is what, what's going to happen, but my concern is that the, the term regenerative agriculture um, has, you know, we've all seen the the you know massive monoculture or certified organic carrot fields in California that are probably some of the most destructive ecosystems on the planet, or the you know the organic uh, um, you know palm oil and stuff like that. Like it's it organic doesn't mean the, the that you're doing other things. And so yes, it'd be great to have others other terms, but it, it, because these ecosystems are so. Um, so dynamic and complex like could we ever settle on 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 metrics that we could that would would transit across the board and and so at, at the end of the day the the thing that that uh, my i hope is and maybe this is just thinking too small is is if 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 the certification is there to protect the consumer um if we had a more bioregional food system where we didn't need these these middlemen like, because the consumer had a direct relationship with the farmer, uh, and they could ask the questions themselves, and they were educated to the point where they could they could use their own discernment from their own context of you know what a healthy ecosystem looks like and tour the farm and things like that. They wouldn't need it anymore. For me, that's what I think. I hope the end goal is based on the a huge amount of energy in our in the transportation of our food and things like that and and the food wastage there's other problems there so i think for me the end goal is a bioregional food system where certification is irrelevant because you don't need a middleman for for somebody who's your friend but in the meantime getting to that point i think we do need to have some kind of a of a um, uh, uh, an agreed upon language that means something but i i'm I'm hesitant to, uh, I haven't seen any good, good examples of that myself yet that, that haven't had other, other problems with them. No, I think those are really great points. And if I could just add to it just quickly, I just think that um, the one thing that I think about often enough with, uh, I, we, we communicate directly with all of our consumers. Well, obviously we're direct to market sales. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I know my consumers do appreciate that I do allow someone onto my farm to look at my books, to look at my inputs, to look at everything. Um, they would, I could leave that behind and I wouldn't lose a single consumer. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, um, I do think that consumers are also very busy with their own very specific jobs and they're, and they can't, we can't expect them to know everything about agriculture and when we can actually make science, uh, based, uh, data available to them that is, is, is legible, is, is, is something that they, they can understand. I think that is a huge benefit. And it, uh, the nice thing about ecological outcome verification, it seems to be fairly context-based. It seems to be showing improvements on your farm. So you're not putting up somebody's sandy soil against my Red River clays um, when it comes to nutrient density or whatever. But what you are looking at is within the last five years, has this, pers has this farm managed the landscape well? Because we do have right now uh, a, a kind of a culture where we can, we can uh, talk about our practices and we can promote our practices as guaranteeing a certain nutrient density or, or doing this or that. And we, we, we're finally at the point in history where science is catching up to a lot of the farming practices that have existed for aeons. And we have the potential to use science to back up what we've been practicing or what people have been saying, what indigenous cultures have been doing. And I, I, I just see that if we should, we should seize that opportunity to meld the two, even if it's for an, an I'm all for a regional uh, foodscape. Um, I think that, but it, I think it would still, a regional foodscape would still benefit from that uh, cooperation between hard evidence and practice. 
but I take your point on the organics thing. You can do organics poorly. You can do every system poorly. Um, the one unfortunate thing about organic certification is that it started out as a, a list of prohibitions rather than um, uh, a, a, a practices based on outcomes, right? So um, that was interesting. Yeah, and 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 that's the, the, I think you're right to, to like the, the, if if this regenerative agriculture thing is is a new thing, it needs to be. Um, outcome based as opposed to like yeah some some kind of prohibitions that are, are too restrictive to to one context or the other and and this is like I have a huge aversion for um, technology but the 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 advancements in like UAVs or drones and their ability to you know measure the photosynthetic photosynthetic capacity of of um, of plants and you know the the robotics now it's like wh what if we like what if we could find a few metrics that that did kind of go across the board and and we could send a robot out into a field with a microphone and it could just you know at night and it could just you know like a Roomba just go around the whole farm recording the sounds and you just threw it into a computer and it just said this is how many species of of animals insects bird life whatever you have on the farm and it was just like the, the certification was just literally somebody dropping off a drone at your farm once a year or quarterly or something to do a biological survey and then measuring you know wetlands and the photosynthetic capacity or some soil tests and you can actually track that that's something that i would i would totally be on on um on on board for yeah great great thoughts there guys i like it measuring life and uh justin's comments about the cultural thing like let's build Western Canadian culture of regenerative agriculture. That's what we need to do. That's why we need to be together having these meetings of the minds. And I appreciate you guys both being on. I really appreciate Mark being here. And I'm gonna throw it back to Duncan and we'll have a wrap up. That was a absolutely phenomenal discussion. Chat was humming, um, over a hundred on the chats. Um, just wanted to uh, say that that was, uh, I, I'd like to think that that was a pretty good example of uh, the dialogue and the provocativeness, certainly the solutions base that MFG aspires for, uh, certainly that uh, bringing together um, such, a, such a group of, of three at the end with uh, Matt and Justin and uh, Dakota was absolutely phenomenal as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it, it was really great to see, so congratulations to all. Um, one of the conversations in that panel was uh, also about financial institutions. Uh, I want you to know that one of our platinum sponsors, the Credit Unions of Manitoba, came forward based on exactly that premise. We pitched to them uh, all their collectives. When you go to credit unions for funding, you go to their um, central system. You don't. Um, we didn't necessarily go to. Um, one or the other, although we did have some talks with, uh, with Assiniboia and also uh, with uh, uh, Strive as well. Um, so we have good support, Sunrise as well, uh, usually in the Southwest, but we did go to present to them and they were extremely um, keen on uh, supporting our group. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, our final uh, platinum sponsor of the night is the Credit Unions of Manitoba. Credit union members enjoy local and digital access to all their banking needs. People bailing. And we're responsible to those member owners who use our services, not distant shareholders. We devote ourselves to helping people and communities thrive. Through our cooperative model, members support each other and their communities, generating economic activity that spreads throughout the province. We belong to Manitoba. We're here for you. Okay, um, first night, uh, as you know, we've been kind of supplementing uh, towards the end, especially, and th for those waiting for their um, CEU credits, it's gonna be up right away. Um, first night, kind of rushed through um, some Made in Manitoba success stories. And for those that are still on, I hope that, uh, that you enjoy these again, even though it might be the second time you've seen them. First one is John Hurd of Manitoba Agriculture Resource Development. John's video is on Manitoba Ag Successful on-farm testing of products or practices depends on the three R's, replication, randomization, and most importantly, to request help, to plan, to assist in imposing treatments and harvesting and for statistical analysis, interpretation. So that's what John's video is about. Terence McGonigal is gonna provide an update on the evaluation of soil carbon stocks in relation to grazing management. So that's the context of these videos, Terence and John. Hi, I'm John Hurd, and I have some on-farm testers right here in the field with me. 
So we're going to just ask them why they're here. Daryl, what yes. are you doing on farm testing? We are learning today uh, what the outcome is going to be of doing some population tests. We are trying to figure out what's best and most economical for us. Very good. Megan Burns with the uh, Pulse and Soybean Growers. Yeah, I'm the on farm network agronomist for the Pulse and Soybean Growers. So I'm involved in treatment selection and trial planning, and most importantly, analysis and interpretation of the data. Good. And the other partner in this? Hi, I'm Jordan Karpachik uh, from Tony Consulting. I'm a contractor that works with the uh, Pulse and Soybean Growers on uh, helping the farmer set up and uh, harvest the on farm tests uh, across Manitoba. Good. Good. Okay, so that's the team that you need when you're doing good on-farm tests, and we'll talk more about that at the show. Terence McGonagall, preliminary data for ongoing studies, new for 2020, deep cores to 100 centimeters with five centimeter diameter, uh, any compacted cores rejected, uh, measuring the, the depth of the hole relative to the length of the core. So 42 cores for Brookdale, increasing bulk density with depth for both the continuous and planned. Across the farms, Bow, Canart, Van Steeland, the same pattern of bulk density with depth. Organic matter analyses ongoing for all cores at all sites. Uh, here's the data for Bow. So increasing uh, uh, depth gives less organic matter, but note that because of the uh, higher bulk density, along with the greater quantities of soil for these uh, larger depth intervals, below 30 centimeters, we have a significant part of the soil carbon stock uh, below 30 centimeters uh, in, the, in the profile. That's it, thanks very much and uh, cheerio. Okay, so we have those two made in Manitobas. I'm gonna put up the CEU slide and talk, uh, talk as it's uh, posted up. Um, one thing uh, that was interesting is someone uh, mentioned on the chat recently is when we go back live and, and then if, uh, if we are gonna go back to live conferences and certainly uh, MFJ has been thinking about next year, we hope that uh, we are able to gather uh, in, in, in person, but uh, that said, uh, we, that's something that's out of control and we all know the rules control what you can control. We have locked down November 15th, 16th, 17th of uh, 2021 um, back in Brandon at the um, at the um, Vic, Vic Inn. Um, we'll have to see what that um, does uh, contain or what that looks like, but uh, that's where we are. We've also been in touch with Nora at the Alberta Soil Health Grazing um, Conference. Um, so that is uh, excellent uh, that we know that they're also uh, going to have some announcements soon on what they're doing. And much like everyone else, we're kind of just all in this really strange holding pattern. So um, next year um, as well is uh, as we have look forward to those dates as well. Um, we do also have a very important uh, event next week with uh, our fourth and final installment of the 2020 Manitoba Forage Grasslands Association Regenerative Agriculture Conference. Uh, next year is our is our uh, Manitoba guy Ryan Boyd. Um, super excited about what Ryan's going to bring to this presentation. He's going to talk about his Nuffield Scholarship travels, which uh, I know by following him around the world, as many of you have, that uh, it was quite an interesting uh, journey that he went on and, and it's focusing around grazing ruminants and different systems around the world. So that's going to be very uh, a very cool um, presentation, certainly uh, along the lines of tonight for uh, for um, some of the information that'll be presented. Our moderator next week has some big shoes to fill. Mr. Matt Steelant was a rock star tonight. I thought Matt did an excellent job as, as a moderator and I'm very happy to announce that Aaron Nervous will be um, next up uh, uh, for our MFG moderator and Aaron will do it. He'll do a great job too. And panel comprised of Brett McRae who did a uh, webcast yesterday on some finances uh, around the beef industry that was well received, Nick Cowan, from Southwest Manitoba and Brian Harper, who um, is a national TESA, the Environmental Stewardship Award winner. So once again, we're gonna ramp up with uh, uh, an end of, uh, uh, end of our month with a really solid presentation. And with that, have a great night.
every journey of agriculture to me is leaving the land better than you got it, improving soil health, improving our lifestyle. A regenerative farmer is a farmer that looks at the system that we're managing as a whole, try to be profitable, but at the same time, enhancing our natural ecosystem, constantly improving the soil and the landscape that we produce food on. Regenerative agriculture is a management mindset, farming and ranching more in tune with nature and nature's processes, being less reliant on external inputs, improving the soil health, if you have healthy soil, you have healthy plants, you have healthy animals, which in turn changes into healthy humans. Healthy soil is important to the success of a ranch because you can grow better crops, your animals are healthier, way better water infiltration. If we've got excessive moisture, the water goes down into the land and is stored in the land, doesn't run off, and then in the dry times, the water's still available for the plants because it's stored in the soils. The future is looking good for our ranch. The soil is getting better instead of worse. Our organic matters are really going up in the soil. We're making nutrient dense food for our livestock and the people that eat it. It's just kind of a win-win situation. When I started farming, I graduated from the University of Manitoba with a Bachelor of Science in Agriculture. Came home to the farm doing things pretty standard, lots of fertilizer, big yields. We were struggling with the profit. That led me to look for a more low risk, more resilient type system. We could start to see the potential to integrate livestock with the grain farm. As we were spending less money on synthetic inputs, there becomes more margin that we can keep in our pocket. The train really has left the station for regenerative agriculture. There's no looking back. And now, best of all, consumers are figuring out that there is this thing called regenerative agriculture, that they can seek out products that are produced regeneratively, and they can put their consumer dollars to work building more resilient farming systems. Regenerative agriculture has made our ranch more viable, mostly by extending our grazing season. We have a lot less days on feed than what you would consider average. When you can increase the production of the soil naturally, you don't really need to necessarily go out and buy more high-priced land. If you can double your efficiency on that land. Grasslands, you're not doing them any favors by leaving them dormant. You get animals in there and they get everything moving and cycling through the soil again. Regenerative agriculture makes you assess what you have available on your land. Whether you have rough coarse land or good crop land, you have to look at what's available. You have to have a long-term picture of what you want on it. Once you have that picture in your mind, you have a goal to go to. But if you don't have that goal, you don't have anything to work towards. I am very proud of MFGA for what we've accomplished in the last five years. We have a strong membership, we now have a voice, and we are talking to producers on a grassroots level. We don't care if you have cattle or you're a grain farmer or just forage. We will talk to everybody trying to improve your bottom line. If another farmer rancher is thinking of regenerative agriculture, I would say definitely go for it. You can cut down on your inputs, grow as good a crops as you were before, if not more. You can cut down on fungicides, pesticides, commercial fertilizer, and basically improve your bottom line. And that's all that matters is your bottom line.